Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker. During an era where many managers are marked by conflict, even within the church, couples get a steady stream of messages like, seek your own happiness, or life is too short to live in an unhappy marriage. Some couples give up the fight only to find a next relationship is no different than the one they left. Our next guest says this unending cycle is not only wearisome, it is physically, emotionally, financially, or spiritually exhausting. Many of the conflicts in relationships begin with misunderstanding and are based on lies, she explains. Others, she says, are based on misguided expectations about roles and responsibilities within the marriage. In her new book, 12 Truths to Change Your Marriage, Nina, Nina Rosner explains the differences between a feminist version or doing marriage and what she calls a complementary approach. She offers a, a third idea, a holitarian approach. The Bible teaches that women are equal to men. Neither gender is better or less than the other. There are differences between the genders, differences between people, and therefore differences between marriages. Nina Rosner is the executive director of Greater Impact Ministries, a Christian training organization in Cincinnati. Nina has more than 20 I'm sorry, more than 20 years in the communications and training industry and has coached executives, managers, individuals, wives, church staffs, and pastors around the country. As a professional speaker for women's group and the, developers, the developer of Daughters of Sarah and the Respect Dare, she has seen hundreds of marriages positively impacted by the understanding and application of the biblical concept of respect. Nina writes consistently about family life and our identity in Christ on her blog. She's been married to her husband, Jim, since 1991. Together, they're privileged to be raising and homeschooling or now grown up three children. Here to co-host the Respect Hour on the first Thursday of every month at 11 a.m. is the author of 12 Truths to Change Your Marriage, Nina Rosner. Nina, welcome to your hour, the Respect Hour, right here on Revealing the Truth. It is so good to be here, Pastor I'm, I'm just so excited that you're here with uh, me doing this. A great opportunity. Well, you are a, uh, a true joy to us and a blessing to our audience because you bring a very balanced, uh, kind of uh, sobering look at these uh, almost mood swings that, that occur within marriages and within people's relationships, and they go from the agony to the ecstasy to the agony and back again. And uh, today, uh, even within the body, uh, 60%, the new numbers coming out, 60% divorce rate in the church and with pastors falling and with uh, sexual sin being so rampant, the sanctity of marriage is as much in question as the sanctity of life. Uh, everybody wanting to do their own thing. Uh, it's just a civil union, and it's lost all of its meaning that it's a covenant relationship with God right there in the middle of it. So I so appreciate your perspective on this that gives uh, balance to our audience. Well, it's good to be here. I love talking with you because you have a messianic <laughs> approach um, and the history of um, Judaism within you. And there's a depth to the understanding of the concepts that, um, you know, your average Christian that doesn't understand the Jewishness of Jesus doesn't really get. And we were talking about that with the word honor and respect before we came on today. And I, I think it'd be great if you shared that um, in terms of the differences in the um, translations. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. And, and you, you having created the Respect Dare, and we had you on uh, to talk about that when we first, uh, back in 2017, when we first went on the air, I think you were one of the very first guests we had on the program uh, when we were just launching the new network. Now we're two and a half years into it, and, yeah. and uh, we've gone from being a startup to an upstart. Uh, but we began this dialogue and this, this narrative of taking a look at the roots of Christianity, the roots of our faith, and the roots are all Jewish, and all the authors of the Bible, uh, not the authors, but the scribes, as yes. I refer to them as, God's the author, they were just yes. the re recorder, uh, had a Hebrew mindset. And so the Hebrew mind is different than the Greek mind. So when we look yes. at the word honor, in the Old Testament, which is mentioned many times, uh, 
the natural inclination to say honor is synonymous with respect. And that's the modern context of the thesaurus, even says that it is a synonym, uh, that they are interchangeable. However, that's not the case in the original text. In the original text, the Hebrew word is kabed, K-A-B-E-D, if you were to spell it out in English. And the root of that is the word kavod, K-A-V-O-D, which means the weight, the weight of his glory. We talk about the weight of God's glory. Uh, let the weight of his glory fall. Uh, this is our cry, let the weight of his glory fall. And we see that played out in Isaiah 6, when he said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the, the train of his garment filled the temple, and the angels surrounding him cried out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory, the weight of his glory. So honor was something that was a weighty, almost a heavy and it was a heaviness based on the first honor was given to God because he was the top. He was the pinnacle. He was the creator. And we were acknowledging by honoring him that we were the creation. And in this attempt to look at God who defines us, there's been so many attempts to give him a name. Uh, to come up with a name so that we can kind of stick them in a box. So there's the Yahweh's and the Jehovah's and uh, uh, these other names attributed. But uh, he says, actually, when Moses asked him, who should I say sent me? He said, Aye, Asher, Aye, which means I am that I am. And that's yeah. sufficient. Uh, God defines us and has dominion over us because he's given us our names. In the Greek mind, if you can name something, you have dominion over it. You can define it, and you have dominion over it. And we know that Adam, was, everything was brought to Adam to give a name. And everything that he gave a name to, he had dominion over, including Eve. So yes. he, brought it, he brought him his wife to name, what shall you call her, Eve. So when we look at this concept that it's not just respect, it's true heaviness. I think the most vivid picture that I can give you is that if we see dignitaries visiting in the Far East and we see one bow to the other, it is the one who bows lowest who is acknowledging the higher rank, the more esteem. And even in the New Testament, we read the words, esteem the other more than yourself. So bow lower, bow lower than them. Okay? Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. And so this idea of honor becomes a heaviness, a weightiness. A, uh, it's more than respect. It's, it's uh, the position of mm -hmm. the person in God's order, not in man's order. Because we look at all these things. Uh, wh husbands love your wives, wives respect your husbands. Yeah, well, if he deserves it, well, yeah, if he does the things he's supposed to do, if he is the man of God he's supposed to be, well, then I'll give him respect. It's so conditional. Respect is a conditional. Honor is unconditional, and it's based on who you're paying honor to. So you give honor, and it tells us this, to the one who is worthy of honor, and not because you were a Pharisee, not because you wanted the front row and you were to do all these things to earn honor. It was to give honor to the one who is worthy of honor. The weight, that worthiness is a heaviness. And so it's really quite different uh, in, the, in the translation into the Greek to just respect. You know, yes, sir. No, ma'am. That's, that's respect. You know, yeah. that's, that's how it's played out in the world today. Yeah, and the world has a, a, a very deep uh, expression of earning respect, uh, so much so that um, we'll be in, almost intentionally disrespectful to people. And it's, it's a very sad place to come from because you're viewing people as um, less than, not precious to God, and that, that behavior is um, definitely damaging to relationships. You know, this all comes back to image bearers. It all comes back to the Hebrew word selem, which, which means um, likeness. You know, we're created, God created us 
in, 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 it says God created us in, in Genesis 5 in our image, mm -hmm. both male and female. And uh, the word Salem is actually, um, uh, kind of, it's almost a play on words. It's a, it's a, it's a feminine, female word okay, applied to, uh, we made man, Adam, which is really for mankind, uh, and both male and female. So we know it's not an external image because I, it, we, we, look, we look at the world. You're either a male or a female. We have people who um, are uh, confused, uh, but this was an internal, not an external. And, and we're both told, both genders are told to honor I mean, men are told in First Peter 3 that you're supposed to consider your wife as um, the weaker vessel and treat her with honor, so much so that your prayers are not going to be answered if you don't do this. And so it's a very mutual kind of thing. The sad part of this is when you when you look at what God told women in Ephesians 5.33 to respect their husbands, um, you, so many people think that, think that that's such a demoting a terrible thing to do. But really, if you look at what we're called to do as Christians, as image bearers and followers of Christ and you know, submitting ourselves to him, we are to treat other people with tremendous gentleness and respect and, and consider them worthy of <laughs> our kindness because God has decided not because we decide, but because God has decided how um, precious they are to him. And we are all created with that specialness about us. You run into difficulties in marriage because you have the, I don't think anybody can trigger our negative emotions more so than a spouse, <laughs> you know, both ways. And you end up with, um, you know, the, the things from our childhood that we don't know that we carry around with us you know, popping up in these conversations. And suddenly, instead of being in this space where we're mature and we're listening to God and focused on um, what his purpose is for our lives, we become just in a hot second, just very focused internally, focused on ourselves. And that selfishness then uh, turns into an emotional reaction that is defensive and it's the opposite of respect. And so the, if there's a way to catch, and I think there is, there's a way to catch those emotions before they morph into something, uh, because that's our immaturity showing up. You know, how easily are we triggered? How emotional are we? Are we grown up in that? Uh, or are we immature in that? Mm. You know, when you talk about this, we've we got very confused when the Greek concept of ethnos was introduced into philosophy and society and the um, Adonis became the the perfect specimen of, of, of a man and uh, you know they had a perfect specimen of a woman and all of a sudden we became became racially aware and we became comparative in our nature, and everything was measured against, uh, you know, I don't look like that standard, and social media came into being, and all of a sudden the ethnos is wild throughout the world, yeah. when in the Bible there's only two people groups, period. There are Jews mm -hmm. and Gentiles. Yeah. And in Romans 11, that's basically, uh, when you become a believer in Jesus, you're now grafted in, so we become the one new man. And he says in Ephesians 2, from the two I shall make one. And mm -hmm. so when that happens, then there are no differences. There is no, the outward appearance uh, is, is really quite foolish because I just came back from two weeks in the Middle East, in Israel, and uh, we, uh, this is my 16th consecutive trip, uh, we worship on Shabbat with on the Saturday morning service in Haifa with a congregation that has Ethiopian Jews. And they're eight inches taller than me and their skin <laughs> is as black as coal and their little children are just 
gorgeous, the, the most precious people. And the pastor is uh, Japanese American, married to a Brooklyn Jewish woman. And you see this, the Russian speaking, you see Arabic speaking, you see uh, Arab Christians, you see Jewish believers, all of this. And you realize that in that Acts chapter 2 picture, we see that they're praying in a language and all these people are gathering. And you realize where we were dispersed to just because you're Ethiopian, just because you're from India, just because you're from uh, Argentina, uh, you can still be Jewish. So it kind of throws the whole how you look concept out the window. There are, uh, there's a uh, Jewish community in Kaifeng, China. Uh, it's the last remaining Jewish community in China. And so what do you think they look like? So if we were to, we would, if we were to look at people and say, you know, they would say to me, funny, you don't you know, say, are you Jewish? Yes, I'm Jewish. They'd say, funny, you don't look Jewish. Well, what is their standard of looking Jewish? Mm -hmm. And so I'm Eastern European. They're Chinese. Uh, they're Ethiopian. So we begin to realize as we see the regathering back to Israel, that we see these, what you would call racial, but they're not. These people are Jewish. They're, they're, that's, that, that is their ethnicity. That is our bloodline. And so we look at the seed line of Messiah. It's, it's a bloodline. It's a lineage uh, that we have. And so uh, it, it, this is why the, um, the rampant anti-Semitism that, that is out there today. And I have to say that, especially for Christians, anti-Jewish is anti-Jesus. Right. And, and they don't connect the two. Anti-Israel is anti-Jesus. He's got to come back to a unified Jerusalem uh, in order for the prophecies to be fulfilled. There can't be a divided Jerusalem. There can't be a divided Israel. They can't eliminate. Uh, what's he going to do? Have to call for landing rights from an organization. Uh, this is Jesus. I'm coming in for a landing. And uh, I need rights to pass through your airspace. I mean, what's, you know, it's foolishness. And that's what King Solomon said. It's all foolishness. Uh, mm -hmm. But we bring these expectations in to our relationships and we have this construct. I don't remember, and I grew up in the 50s uh, and, and 60s. Uh, my grandparents honored each other from the old mm -hmm. country. Uh, oh. they, they had great esteem. As a matter of fact, um, my grandfather didn't ever call my grandmother by her name Lillian. He mm. called her a Yiddish word called Bleem. Uh, never referred to her other than that, which means my flower. Oh, that's sweet. I, I never heard him say her name. Mm. He always referred to her as my flower or my beautiful flower. And this was just uh, so endearing. And, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't know when I was a little kid, but as I grew older and began to learn Yiddish words and, and understand it, uh, I saw this honor, this, this reverence for each other. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's quite extraordinary. And I think that, that uh, this is one of the reasons that uh, not only your work and the respect there, but in mentoring, having people who here you're now married 28 years, Right. You've been through from, <laughs> from stem to stern all, yeah. all that you had to deal with, your husband had to deal with. You know, this is drawn off of your experience. This isn't drawn off perfection. Uh, this was right. your, you, you and I both kicking and screaming into our gifts. <laughs> Very true. Yes. And I, I, well, I have one thing that I say over and over again to the women that are in our, in our classes, and that is God is going to turn your mess into message uh, because we all have a message that he's bringing to life and our lives are that testimony for that. And it's really sad that we have to get in the way of, you know, him <laughs> for us to be able to connect, but he's very specific about that, that the things that we suffer through will be used to help others who are suffering. And that's that's what we do at Greater Impact, is connect with people that are, are suffering in their marriage. And that's a lot of people. 
And it, and it, I think that's because the marriage relationship is is fraught with expectations. Yeah, and instead of putting our hope in the Lord and our hope in our relationship with Jesus Christ and listening to the Holy Spirit, we, we put our hope into this person treating us a certain way. And so we have this expectation that they're going to do things differently than they do. And they end up hurting us and we're not prepared for that. So we get surprised and then we don't behave well because we don't have it's not like you're at work and you're trying hard to be be impressing others and treating other others respectfully because you have a reputation to uphold it's it's like you set your shield down and your sword down when you walk in the door at night and you're around your spouse and that's that's not acceptable and i think god wants us to have a totally different attitude about that that we don't do that we keep our armor on all day especially with the people that we're called to love and respect because that represents Christ's relationship with the church. You know, the reverence that his people have for him needs to show up in our marriage. And it's not a submissive in a subservient kind of way. It's, it's a mutual submissive type thing, but also um, very respectful and acknowledging the uh, responsibility that the husband has for the family and so you know you see a lot of wives struggling with being controlling and it's not respectful behavior so there's just a lot of that and it parallels what you're talking about with Christ and Israel and you know, the coming together the unifying that God's doing over there you know it's interesting in Genesis there are 33 verses that tell us about creation mm. There are 66 verses that tell us about finding a wife. So when Abraham sent Eleazar out and gave him the instructions, and then Eleazar's cry out to the Lord to show him who should be the one, twice as many verses in Genesis about finding a wife and where to go and how to do it and what, what was required uh, then then the, the study of creation. Uh, God put twice as much emphasis in his word on the finding of a wife. Mm -hmm. So this institution that God created of marriage, if it's of him, if it's for him, and if it's with him, then it should be a model that draws people to us uh, as opposed to this offended, easily offended, unforgiving, unrelentless complaining and grumbling and uh, in, in the Yiddish kvetching and, and just you know constantly nagging one another or uh, pulling away and finding a separate identity when the primary identity is within the marriage and then you encourage one another to be like the two strong oak trees Right, that that uh, don't grow, uh, we talk about the tall cedars, that don't grow in each other's shadow, but they grow close enough to each other to be a support so that you can then build upon it. And so that becomes the pillars that you then, if you take a look at your house, when your house was framed, okay, they laid the foundation and then they started with the corners. When you do a, a jigsaw puzzle, you start with the corners and the edges and then you build to the center. And all these things are pictures that God uses of things in the natural revealing to a supernatural truth that we can identify with that puzzle picture so easily that that piece that goes in the center, the last piece, the one that has to be the centerpiece, the one that finishes it, is the author, the one who created the puzzle, and the finisher, okay, the last piece, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, is God right there mm -hmm. in the middle. And without that, the whole picture can't be taken in, can't be seen. And we've lost, we've, we've lost that reverence for God. Uh, I think the Father has been taken out of the church. I think the Holy Spirit has been taken out of the church and where you become Jesus only, which is fine to a certain extent, but unless we have the full counsel of heaven, unless we embrace the fullness 
of God's plan of salvation, God's plan for marriage, God's plan for forgiveness, and the message and the example of the Messiah, but we don't know how to walk. It's, it's, uh, it's difficult to navigate because the Bible tells us what to do, but it doesn't always tell us how to do it. Yeah, definitely. You're absolutely right. And you, we don't have those examples that we used to see. I think it's even worse now uh, because of what the culture has devolved into. And, you know, we need more of those examples. And, and that's, that's really my goal. That's why I breathe is to, you know, learn those things myself, model them to the people that are the women that are trying to do the same things in their homes and, and with their, their families, with their kids. So. We're talking with Nina Rosner, author of 12 Truths to Change Your Marriage, along with the respect there, and the, she's the developer of Daughter of Sarah, and has spent over 20 years uh, coaching and training, as well as ministering to wives who are searching desperately for new meaning and for new depth and a new construct in their marriage, which begins with this concept of respect. And as we look at this core value of God, we realize that this is an honoring. This is esteeming the other more than yourself. Uh, if you are looking out for your spouse's needs and they are looking out for your needs, then both your needs get met without any selfishness. And so if you truly have balance, and the balance, the pendulum sw swings. Sometimes it's 100% you, sometimes it's 100% them. It's not always 50-50, and that's not the way it's designed. Uh, men, you are to be the spiritual head of the household, and that's something that men uh, need to be challenged to step up to. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to talk about this concept of trust and some of the stunning revelations that Juanina uh, emailed me. She wanted to talk about trust. I did the Bible study and the word search, and uh, I was stunned at what I found, and I think you will be too. We'll be right back after these messages. Not everything that makes the headlines has biblical importance, but many events that happen around the world do, and you never hear about them. Igniting a Nation is pleased to teach revealing prophecy every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at the Marriott 280 in Birmingham. We will cover worldwide events and insider information that will connect the dots of what's happening around the world with biblical prophecy. If you happen to miss a class, we'll televise each week's class at 10 o'clock Central Time on IgnitingAnation.com and all our social media outlets. Copies of the teachings will also be available to purchase on our website at www.IgnitingAnation.com. The Lord meets you right where you are, and so does Igniting Nation's new live streaming outlets. You can now watch Revealing the Truth, Revealing the Bible, and Prophecy Revealed simulcast live each Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 1 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on YouTube Live, Facebook Live, Vimeo, Periscope, and through our website www.ignitinganation.com. No matter what device you are using, our program will automatically scale so you won't have to miss a single program. And if you happen to miss an episode, you can always subscribe to the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel and access over 1,000 interviews and never miss your favorite authors, special guests, and topics that interest you the most. There are lots of ways to see Israel. But nothing compares to seeing the land of the book and the people of the book through the eyes of two Jewish believers who can take you on a journey that will bring the entire Bible to life. When you join Rabbi Eric Walker and his number one rated tour guide, Edo Canaan in Israel, you'll experience incredible teachings, first class accommodations, and actually walk where Jesus walked. You will experience the Bible transforming from black and white into living color, and you will never see the Bible in the same way again. For more information, visit us at www.ignitinganation.com forward slash events. The Lord contends with what contends with you, and Igniting a Nation is committed to bringing to light each and every issue that faces a believer's life. 
Our live stream programming and teachings take you on a journey to finding biblical truth from a wide variety of experts who share their insights into a deeper walk with the Lord. We have assembled the most comprehensive panel of experts in the fields of prophecy, caregiving, healing from trauma, shame and abuse, and so much more. We continue to expand our teachings and programming to meet your needs. We're committed to healing the nations with biblical truth. Visit www.ignitinganation.com to develop a deeper walk with the Lord and start your journey to a transformed life. The Bible commands us to study to show ourselves approved, but most study using Bible study tools and not actually studying the Bible chapter and verse. Igniting a Nation is pleased to present Revealing the Bible, recorded and taught each week before a live audience. We take you deeper into the actual Bible and verse in both Hebrew and English and connect the dots between the Old and New Testament. You can attend our two classes in Tuscaloosa and Birmingham or watch the program every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Central Time on IgnitingAnation.com and all our other simulcast outlets. For more information, visit www.IgnitingAnation.com forward slash events. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, welcoming you into the Respect Hour, co-hosted by my dear friend Nina Rosner, author of The Respect Air and 12 Truths to Change Your Marriage, A Respect Air Journey for Wives. Nina, welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. It's great to have you. Always a lively conversation when it comes to marriage and uh, uh, this concept of respect. Uh, but there's another core uh, concept that uh, we're going to bring into this discussion, and that is the concept of trust. And uh, some really amazing uh, revelation as I took your, your word trust and, and dug into the scriptures and uh, not only are we admonished not to trust people, uh, we're admonished to just put our trust in the Lord. Yes. Uh, period. Everybody else will disappoint. <laughs> Yes, every, every, including ourselves. Including ourselves. You can't, yeah. you can't trust yourself. The worst of all, you can't trust yourself. You can probably trust somebody else more than you can trust yourself. God said that every inclination of the imagination of a man's heart is wicked. Mm -hmm. You can't trust that. Uh, so how does that play out in uh, marriage where trust is such, uh, trust would be tantamount to faithfulness. Trust would be tantamount to loyalty to uh, not tearing, uh, not, not uh, airing your family's dirty laundry, not uh, uh, saying derogatory things about your wife in a social setting. Uh, all those things that tear people down, how does that play out in understanding of trust in the, in the relationship? Well, Jesus was pretty clear about the nature of human beings. And he, he told us, you know, that he didn't trust people. And when you look at First um, Peter 3, 5, I believe, you know, it talks about how beautiful the women of old were because they put their hope, their trust in God. And we, we live in this culture where there's all these romantic movies, <laughs> and there's all these romantic stories, and the princess culture. And, uh, you know, the, that's, that's great, but it's not reality. And reality is that we're dealing with, I'm a sinner, the man I married is, is a sinner, and we're supposed to represent Christ's re uh, relationship with the church. Well, how's that work? What does that even look like? It's impossible. So we just have to do our best and recognize that the other person is trying to do their best as well. And so what is, you know, when you look at how does that show up, it, it looks like being gentle in our communication. It looks like not being selfish and not making everything about us. You know, you can, you can give, we all know people like this that, I mean, we've had relationships, maybe we've even been these people that, you know, our friend will get a compliment from another friend and we'll think, well, she didn't say something nice about me. 
or our husband will get a promotion and we'll be like, well, I just have this stupid job or, you know, I'm staying home and we'll denigrate. We'll make it about us. And it's, it's never about us. <laughs> Most of life is just not about us. If we make it about God, then we're living in a space that's actually very mature. And we look at the way that human beings develop and, you know, what science is this discovered. I mean, it's pretty clear in the Bible that, you know, we mature in stature and wisdom with God and with men. You know, maturity is a thing. So, and Christ did that. So we have to look at, well, what does that look like in, in the average human? And we start out as children, which are very self-absorbed creatures. And then we move into this socialized uh, place where we're getting our identity from other people. And then we move into this place where we're self self-authoring, meaning we're we have a purpose. We know what it is. Ideally, it's the purpose that God gave us for breathing. And, and it's only in that space, honestly, when we and I think we flip back and forth based on our wounding to the socialized. But when when we're in the space where we're fully aware of why we breathe and who gave us breath and what our purpose is on the planet, then we're able to interact with grace with others at a whole different level. And the reason for that is because not our, our life isn't about us. And it sounds kind of um, self-deprecating, but it really isn't. It, it's a it's a putting someone up, the putting God up where He is and staying focused on that, versus being focused on ourselves. We're I I don't want to think about myself. I, I do I do public speaking coaching uh, is a, a thing that I do and. Um, when I have a class of students, we always deal with the anxiety. And I teach them over and over again, you have to stop thinking about yourself. Just stop looking at thinking about what you look like, what you sound like. Think about your audience. And when they do that, when they're able to do that, they are not nervous. And it's the same thing in an inter interpersonal relationship. It may not be anxiety, but we can't we can't expect other people to bring us the kind of comfort and, and put us on a pedestal, it doesn't, it just doesn't work. And so trusting God is really the only thing that we should be doing. And we should be expecting and understanding that people are sinners, us included, and we're gonna fall short all the time. And so when we don't, then that's celebration. You know, Nina, we miss the uh with this me generation, we miss the concept of it's we, not me, mm -hmm. and the order in which God has the family. Uh, when I led a congregation, founded uh, a synagogue here in Birmingham, I would explain to the congregation that unless we do everything in decency and order, God's going to spend more time trying to get the congregation lined up and not be able to deal with me as the head. Mm -hmm. Same way with the father and his family. If, he's, if God's having to deal with the children and deal with the wife and, and, and get them all lined up where he can see, he can't see, his eyes are on the head. God deals, always deals with the head. He doesn't deal with the body. So you look at the 44 human kings of Israel, 45 if you add God uh, to that number, 44 kings of Israel, God dealt with the wicked kings okay, and the people suffered. God dealt with the righteous kings and the people prospered. So the same concept, these are, you know, if it, if it starts out that way and then God shows, it builds upon that, then that becomes a precept of God. That becomes something that we can apply that God deals with the head. Okay, so you want to kill a snake, you cut off the head. You don't cut off the tails. So, so goes the, the head, so goes the body. The head leads the body. You can't, the feet can't stay behind when the head start, says it's time to move. The feet can't say, I'm, I'm not moving. Okay? Yeah. Uh, you, it has to go. So if God is constantly having to deal with someone who's not stepped up to their responsibility, of, of uh, being the head, uh, then you rob yourself and your family of blessings that God has for you. 
and we serve a God who blesses. You know, the God, people always say the God of the Old Testament was so, so harsh and, and uh, killed all these people and, and uh, thank God for that sweet Jesus. Uh, but the seed line of the Messiah was being protected. And in addition, Jesus doesn't come back so sweet. He doesn't come back right. so gentle. Uh, he comes back as the son of David on a horse with a sword in his sword. mouth and a chain in his hand. Uh, yeah. He's not coming back to play. Uh, he was done with recess and recess is over. Uh, and now the battle is coming for the victory that was prophesied in Genesis 3.15, the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And so... When we look at this model of a family unit, uh, it's supposed to be one family made up of many parts. Well, the same as God. This is in the image of God. God is one God, uh, two parts invisible, one part visible. We can see God the Son, but we can't see the Spirit or the Father. Okay? I can see Nina the person, in the flesh, but I can't see your spirit or your soul. So we know that we are that image bearer or created the same way. But if we don't take the assignment given to us and back to honor and respect for what we are charged with and we try to do the other person's job or we're resentful of the other person's assignment or the other person's gifts, uh, we're jealous of their gifts. I wish I could play the piano. Uh, well, you could if you would have practiced when you were a kid and you would have stuck through the lessons instead of going to play ball or ride your bike. You could have done that, but you didn't. You made those other choices, and so you don't play the piano today. You can't sit there and wish away uh, what you could or could not have done. So these, these conflicts... Uh, that exist in the marriage about expectation and about comparisons, about trust, respect, about honor, uh, become very convoluted when the word me or I, me, and my come into the equation. Yeah. And it, it's a hard thing for people to grasp. And I, I deal mostly with women and a lot of couples, but um, what, what happens oftentimes is I'll hear the same thing, and it, that is, well, my husband won't lead. And you don't understand, he's not, he's not growing as a Christian. And you don't understand, he's not kind to me. You know, those, those, those types of things. And again, it's very externally focused. You know, Jesus didn't say to us, um, come party on my yacht. He said, pick up your cross and follow me. And we don't understand what that really means. And we can, regardless of the circumstances we are in, we are called to rise above that and act with strength and dignity and be image bearers in a way that is a blessing to other people and models. And it, it's not really, it's not a choosing to act kind of thing. It's a choosing to get out of the way because we know what Christ would do. He's telling us what he's wanting to do and we're not listening. We're running ramshot over him and, and doing our own thing because we're so, we have such an unhealthy relationship with ourselves that we're clawing, claw, claw, clawing, sorry, trying to get something instead of just sitting back, accepting what we have, which is difficulty, because that's life. Life is filled with difficulty. We can't see the blessing unless we accept that there's difficulty there. And, and we have to um, warmly, open-handedly say, okay, this isn't mine. What do you want me to do? And then be open to whatever uh, interaction that looks like. It's usually loving. It can be firm and truthful. But you know, if we're, if we're right and we're yelling, if we're critical, then it doesn't matter. It really doesn't. And one of the things that I see a lot, and, and this is both men and women, but I mo work mostly with women, that, that, that desire to control uh, is based in fear and so we'll step into the, the position of leadership or we'll step into a situation and, and try to manipulate it or we'll tell our husband what to do. The only time you tell anybody what to do is between the ages of birth and two years old. And then you're coaching. You're not telling. 
<laughs> and, when, and if you don't get that by the time you've got teenagers, they will help you get it because they will rebel and it will be ugly. So when you have a, a baby, a two-year-old or a five-year-old or whatever, and they, you say, hey, here's a cookie. Can you share it with somebody else? You know, A lot of times they're like, no, it's my cookie. But as they grow, if you're coaching, then they don't have to hang on to everything. They're not so afraid to lose it. They know that there's abundance, that mom will give them another cookie if they want one or something like that. And when you get to a mature place, you're like, here, I don't need this. Can I give you this cookie? And the feel good that we get from serving and loving others is our being able to share and joy that God has when we follow him. And that is 10 times worse than scraping and clawing to get what we want and control our situation. So it's, it's a very difficult concept to understand. And I don't pretend to get it right 100% of the time by any stretch of the imagination. But I know when I do get it right, because I can feel his pleasure within me. And, and it's his just he's pleased and he blesses me with that knowledge and it's great just great our children do exactly what jesus said i only do what i saw my father do and i only say what i heard my father say and so as parents our children are going to model the response to each other you know why are you yelling at your brother well you yell at dad <laughs> you know yeah. I, I heard you yelling at him uh, mm -hmm. You know, your brother, why are you yelling at your sister? Because I heard dad yelling at you. Or, uh, you know, what, why, why is there a double standard? And so the older and more communicative they get, the more vo they're able to vocalize these kind of things. You hear that. You see it played out in your children mm -hmm. in either rebellion or disrespect or defiance. And you begin to realize that this is what I've bred. This is, I'm, I'm reaping what I sowed in my marriage. And mm -hmm. there are no behind closed doors. There are no, there's nothing without, their ears are uh, sonar. They, they hear from miles away uh, yeah. and, and retain. Uh, and you ask them, you know, when, you, when they say something, where, where, where did you learn that? Where did, who, where did you hear that? Oh, from, the, from you, Daddy. I, I heard you say that when uh, we were in the car the other day. And I, oh, yikes. Oh. Well, and you hear people talk about, well, I'm, I'm waiting until the kids get older and then I'm going to file for divorce. Yeah, you know, here's the deal with that. It, your kids know, they've got the vibe. They already know that there's problems and they feel insecure in that already. And so you can go get divorced or you can learn how to do relationship well in the marriage that you're in while you have a context to work through instead of putting everybody in your life through this horrible separation process. It's like pulling one of your arms off. Emotionally, that's what it's like for your kids, especially, and us, if we go through that. And, and then you, you're gonna go find somebody else, have limerence for two years, and then you're gonna start having the same problems because you didn't work those out in the other space. And so when, when we're in a relationship that's difficult, we have to figure out how to move forward in that. And we don't do it by keeping a list of wrongs and by demanding our own way. We do do this when we encourage and build each other up and focus on what's good, what's um, right, true, noble, admirable, praiseworthy, and excellent. That's what we should be doing. We should be casting our cares to God. But instead we put our hope in man and that just doesn't work very well. And one of the things that I've just been so excited to see is we have a, um, is it okay if I talk about my retreat real quick? Of course. Okay. So we do an annual retreat um, once a year and it's called deflating defensiveness. And women come to this to learn how to put a stop in between what they're hearing and their response to that, their reaction to that. And so they learn how to um, interact with themselves more healthfully. And what happens is a lot of these women are coming to us on, in, in despair emotionally, wondering if they should divorce. And, and they leave and then they, we stay in community with them um, on Facebook. They, they're part of a, a community we have. And they leave and they're encouraged and they, they've put their hope back in the right place. <laughs> they've taken it off of this space over here where it doesn't fit properly and there's no way I mean husbands are great people but they're they're terrible gods right so we take it off of there put our hope in God again 
And then it's a constant battle of fighting the culture to keep it over there. But it's very exciting to see people turn away from the notion of divorce and choose to allow God to grow them in the marriage that they're in. And it helps their children as well because they need to learn that as well. You know, you stick and, it out. Yeah. And, and you do this with women. Husbands certainly need to go through the same kind and find uh, an organization like Greater Impact, a counselor, someone that they can speak with. Uh, I love the marriage mentor model where an older couple uh, latches on to a younger couple and shares the 40 years of their marriage and the ups and the downs and gets to coach and mentor. And that was the model of old is that because you had more involvement with your uh the, 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 the previous generations, there was more interaction, it was more family focused. We're now uh, dispersed, the family's yeah. dispersed. I haven't been back in Pittsburgh since, uh, and lived there since I left at age 14. Uh, mm -hmm. So I haven't been at the family, and I just have two, my mother and my sister still live there. Uh, but that's, you know, 43, 53, I'm sorry, 53 years ago. Uh, when I left. So, you know, you, you disperse. You, mm -hmm. you, you don't have... Uh, so what I got, I got in the first 14 years. Yeah. You know? And those are, you know, that's, that, those are the formative years. Uh, but we need the mentoring and men need the counseling. I've been... Uh, <clears throat> I got a great deal out of it. Uh, it helped me tremendously to get past some uh, betrayals and some some trust, uh, that trust uh, yeah. situation. Uh, but it's healthy. It's, it's healthy to go ask for help. And, you know, we know where our help comes from. Our help comes from the Lord, but he uses people too. He uses right. professionals. This is why we're on with you once a month for uh, the Respect Hour to talk about these kind of things in context of marriage and relationships and what does the word really say in regard to these matters and they are simple but yet incredibly complex they require thick skin uh, can't be easily offended and you can't have an agenda and your own way uh, narcissism has no home in a happy home so uh, you know that's a, st a strong word uh, we've been talking with Nina Rosner, author of 12 Truths to Change Your Marriage, A Respect Their Journey for Wives, talking about respect, trust, honor, how to play that out in your marriage. A tremendous resource. You can find her online at, uh, I believe, The Respect Air. Is that correct? It's greaterimpact.org. Great, okay, The Respect Air, Greater Impact. Uh, there we go. Uh, greaterimpact.org. Uh, and you can read about the respect de there as well, uh, and also get these books. The Respect Dare started out with the Respect Dare, and then 12 Truths to Change Your Marriage, a Respect Dare Journey for Wives. It doesn't begin until you start, and it never ends <laughs> until you take your last breath. Nina Rosner, thank you for this hour with us here on Revealing the Truth. God bless you and all that you do. Yeah. Same to you, sir. It's been just a pleasure to be here. God bless you. Thank you. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.